This video is sponsored by HelloFresh. Keep watching to learn how you can gain a special discount on your first order. A Song of Ice and Fire is not only known for its graphic depictions of bloody battles. The super popular fantasy series written by George R.R. R. Martin is also known for its lengthy descriptions of foods. All of the political scheming, backstabbing, and uncomfortable pairings can leave a person hungry. Our favorite characters like Tyrion Lannister, Daenerys Targaryen, and Jon Snow often tuck into many sumptuous meals. Crisp capons, mashed neeps drowned in butter, expensive wines, and let's not forget the hot bread fresh from the oven. But the violence that permeates the series knows no bounds. It can oft times show up in unlikely places. That includes the dining room. You might be shocked to know that such instances of unseemly violence have occurred in our real world as well. Many a meal in real life has ended in murder. Truth is stranger than fiction. Today, I am bringing you three deadly dinners from our own real world history, two of which may have inspired events in A Song of Ice and Fire. Starting with number three, General Harpagus, his son, and the Frey Pies. In A Storm of Swords, the Lord of White Harbor, Wyman Manderley, loses his son in the infamous incident known as the Red Wedding. When the banquet feast honoring the union of Edmure Tully and Rosalind Frey turns into a bloody battle. Wendell Manderley is shot through the mouth with a crossbow quarrel while holding a leg of lamb. The political turmoil after the death of the young wolf and his cause sees Wyman Manderley join his forces with those of House Lannister and their allies, House Frey and House Bolton, the perpetrators of the Red Wedding. Wyman's surviving son, Willis, was kept a hostage by the Freys. As a prisoner, Willis often begged for more food as compared to the other captives. This inspired the mountain Sir Gregor Clegane to feed him bowls of roast goat. This wasn't real goat, however, but human flesh. Vargo Hote, a sellsword from Kohor, was butchered by the mountain and the pieces cooked up to feed Willis and Vargo himself. You see, Vargo Hote was called the goat. The name comes from a religion in Kohor where the deity is a black goat. Vargo Hote, in his final moments, lived deliciously indeed. Willis was recently freed and sent back to his father in White Harbor. Though Wyman presents a helpless front to his new allies, he is no friend of the Freys. He may drink with Jared and jape with Simon, he may even promise the absurdly named Rhaegar Frey the hand of his own beloved granddaughter, but that does not mean he has forgotten. The North remembers and the Mummer's Farce is almost done. Wyman's son is home. Ever since the Red Wedding, Wyman has been plotting and scheming his vengeance. It is no surprise then that when Wyman and his army marched their way to Winterfell for another wedding, several of the Freys escorting them go missing. At Winterfell, Wyman insists he has no idea where the aforementioned Simon, Jared, and Rhaegar have gone. He gave them guest gifts and sent them on their way. His story is accepted by the Freys, but only because it can't be disproved. It should be noted that Wyman Manderley is a man with a prodigious appetite. He eats quite a lot and is well known in the realm for his great size. He is known as Lord Too Fat to Sit a Horse. Indeed, as part of his baggage train to Winterfell, Wyman brings a large assortment of food, including three huge meat pies. These are for the wedding. Quote, the wedding guest gorged on cod cakes and winter squash, hills of neeps and great round wheels of cheese, on smoking slabs of mutton and beef ribs charred almost black, and lastly, on three great wedding pies. As wide across as wagon wheels, their flaky crust stuffed to bursting with carrots, onions, turnips, parsnips, mushrooms, and chunks of seasoned pork swimming in a savory brown gravy." End quote. 
Wyman himself enjoys many slices of the pies, encouraging others to do the same. We are told they are filled with pork, but could the meat actually be from a more dangerous game? Wyman begs Abel the bard to sing the song of the rat cook during the feast. The song is about a simple cook who served in the night fort, a castle of the night's watch. During his time, he served a visiting Andal king a pie made of bacon and the flesh of the king's own son. To curse the cook for breaking guest right, the gods turned him into a monstrously huge white rat that was only capable of devouring its own young. Hence the name, the Rat Cook. The disappearance of the Frey Men, Wyman requesting the song about the Rat Cook and the three huge pork pies, it's all very suspicious. Pork is the meat that is often described as being the closest in smell and taste to human flesh. This heavily suggests that Wyman had the phrase killed, cooked, and served in pies for their own relatives to eat. Though the phrase were traitors who broke guest right, all for a slight on their honor, which, let's face it, they did not have much of, Wyman's actions are horrifying. He has become a monster that feeds on the flesh of humans. So it may horrify you to know that Wyman and the Rat Cook's pies are based on real historical events. Harpagus was a Median general from 6th century BC. The Medes were an ancient Iranian people. The last Median king was Astyages, son of Syaxeres. The name Syaxeres bears a striking resemblance to the name of Prince Daemon Targaryen's dragon, Caraxes. Astyages had two dreams that his downfall would come in the form of his own grandson. To stave off the prophecy, Astyages had Harpagus go and kill the boy. Harpagus could not bring himself to do it, so he gave the infant to a shepherd who had recently given birth to a stillborn son. And he presented the stillborn son to King Astyages as confirmation his dark deed had been done. Many years later, King Astyages discovers that the child, now called Cyrus, is still alive. Harpagus is invited to the king's palace for a great feast, which surprises him as he expected to be punished for his failure. Here is what the scribe called Herodotus writes about the feast in his account called Histories. Quote, Astyages meanwhile took the son of Harpagus and slew him, after which he cut him in pieces and roasted some portions before the fire and boiled others. And when all were duly prepared, he kept them ready for use. The hour for the banquet came and Harpagus appeared and with him the other guests and all sat down to the feast. Astyages and the rest of the guests had joints of meat served up to them. But on the table of Harpagus, nothing was placed except the flesh of his own son. This was all put before him except the hands and feet and head which were laid by themselves in a covered basket. When Harpagus seemed to have eaten his fill, Astyages called out to him to know how he enjoyed the repast. On his reply that he enjoyed it excessively, they whose business it was brought him the basket in which were the hands and feet and head of his son and bade him open it and take out what he pleased. Harpagus accordingly uncovered the basket and saw within it the remains of his son. The sight, however, did not scare him or rob him of his self-possession. Being asked by Astyages if he knew what beast's flesh it was that he had been eating, he answered that he knew very well and that whatever the king did was agreeable. After this reply, he took with him such morsels of the flesh as were uneaten and went home, intending, as I conceive, to collect the remains and bury them. End quote. Like Wyman Manderley, Harpagus hides his desire for revenge very well. He would eventually aid Cyrus in defeating Astyages, fulfilling the prophecy the Median king tried desperately to avoid. In doing so, Astyages only assisted in making the prophecy a reality. This historical account or legend teaches an early lesson in the twisting nature of prophecy. Number two on our list. King Stephen, his son Eustace, 
and the poisoning of Joffrey, son of Cersei. Introduced in A Game of Thrones, Joffrey's so-called Baratheon is one of the major antagonists of the series, at least in the beginning. Joffrey's behavior at the start of the series is like that of a spoiled, pampered brat prince. The way he teases and taunts Robb Stark, causing the Lannister guard to laugh and join in on his derision, is very reminiscent of another fantasy antagonist, Draco Malfoy. They are both rich, blonde, and inbred after all. It takes multiple books before Draco becomes violent, even murderous, whereas Joffrey, we learn very quickly, he's not just a bully, he's a monster. It is Joffrey that sends an assassin to kill Brandon Stark with the cat's paw dagger. It is Joffrey that attempts to maim or perhaps even murder Arya Stark on the trident. It is Joffrey that orders the death of Eddard Stark upon the stairs of the Great Sept of Baelor. And once Ned is dead and his daughter Sansa becomes a hostage, Joffrey orders his king's guard to physically abuse the poor girl when it pleases him. Despite being only 13 years old and having a regent, Joffrey often sits the Iron Throne to dispense what it amuses him to call justice. Having petitioners to the throne imprisoned, tortured, or executed with little to no thought. His bloody reign is cut short with his death at the Purple Wedding. The sumptuous banquet consisting of 77 delicious courses was supposed to be the start of a new era in Westeros, a Lannister era. Instead, it ended in murder. During the feast, Joffrey became very drunk on wine. He was given a very large seven-sided chalice as a wedding gift and spent the evening drinking heavily from it. When it came time to cut the pie, Joffrey was staggering. The room's attention was all on the bride and the groom. No one paid attention to Lady Elena Tyrell as she slipped a poisonous gem into the chalice for Joffrey to drink. It had the appearance of a black amethyst from Ashai, one hidden among many other real gemstones in the web of spun silver that was Sansa Stark's hairnet. Joffrey drank the wine, swallowing down the poison known as the Strangler, and he was doomed. The king choked to death in front of a crowd. No one could save him, not Tywin, not the Maesters, not even his own mother. For the average person, planning a banquet with 77 courses is not likely to ever be an issue. But what about planning something as simple as breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Dining out is becoming more expensive these days and not everyone is as rich as the Lannisters. That's why the words of House Pendragon are, there's food at home. And that's where HelloFresh comes in. HelloFresh takes the hassle out of mealtime by delivering pre-portioned ingredients and easy to prepare recipes right to your door. You might be the type of person that finds cooking to be stressful. You don't like shopping at the store with a long list of items that must needs be acquired, navigating a maze of aisles that always seems to be changing every time you visit, and the worst part of all, the people. Why does it seem like every self-checkout is always clogged with people that don't seem to know what they're doing? Anyway, you can skip the checkout lines because HelloFresh has dinner covered. And if you're a novice in the kitchen, do not worry. You don't have to be a maester chef to enjoy meals with HelloFresh. In fact, you'll spend less time in the kitchen with quick and easy meals from HelloFresh. They have a variety of options to choose from like their fast and fresh pineapple chicken tacos or the falafel power bowls, all ready in 15 minutes or less. One of my biggest pet peeves is wasting food. It's always upsetting when I buy fresh produce and before I know it, the avocado I bought, it's turned to mush. The apples are rotten to the core and the potatoes, they now have more eyes on them than Blood Raven. Good food is too precious to waste. That's why I appreciate HelloFresh's pre-portioned ingredients. They cut down on food waste by at least 23% compared to grocery shopping which is good for your wallet and mine and the planet. Like Daenerys said, let's leave the world better than what we found it. How it works is you pick your plan, you get your delivery, and then you start cooking. It's just that simple. To get a special discount and support the channel, click the link below 
or scan the QR code or go to HelloFresh.com and use code POGHF113010. Now, the Dothraki might consider your meal to be a bit dull, but then again, the Dothraki consider a wedding without at least one death to be a dull affair. The Purple Wedding would have been a splendid event in their eyes. Joffrey's death at his own wedding by poison is based on the death of a prince called Eustace IV, Count of Boulogne. Eustace was the son of disputed King Stephen and his wife, Queen Matilda. King Stephen's title is contested because he usurped the throne from his niece, the Empress Maud. Maud was the sole surviving heir of her father, Henry I of England. Henry's son and original heir died in a tragic accident. Henry declared Maud to be his heir if he died without a son to succeed him. Henry and his second wife never conceived another child. He had his barons swear vows to recognize Maud's claim to the throne. Eustace, like Joffrey, has a sour reputation. It was said that Eustace, quote, was an evil man and did more harm than good wherever he went. He spoiled the lands and laid thereon heavy taxes, end quote. Though some accounts do say that Eustace acted in a manner as befitting of an heir to the throne. So perhaps the slander comes from the heavy taxation. But then again, we must needs remember Joffrey often put on a good show when in the public eye. Eustace is said to have died suddenly. One historical account tells us that Eustace died during a dinner. Quote, Having thus taken revenge on the monks, Eustace sat down to dinner and, as the story is told, was choked by the first morsel he attempted to swallow. The truth appears to be that the unfortunate prince was already under brain fever. But, however that may have been, Eustace of Boulogne died on the 10th of August 1153 at the age of 18 and was laid by his mother's side in the Abbey of Feversham. End quote. George R. R. Martin has admitted that Eustace's death was the direct inspiration for Joffrey's death at the Purple Wedding. But here is where historians and Martin disagree on what happened to the young lord. Martin and others hint that maybe Eustace didn't choke, maybe he was poisoned. Other historical accounts leave out Eustace's death at dinner. Some believe he was struck down by God after committing war crimes in church-owned lands. Divine intervention aside, this more than likely means Eustace died suddenly of some unknown medical event. Such sudden deaths were, of course, not uncommon during those times, but medical knowledge was quite limited. Apoplexy was the term used to describe these medical events, where people died moments after losing consciousness. Others believe Eustace died of a broken heart. The cause of this broken heart, my research could not determine. Broken heart syndrome is a real medical condition. If Eustace suffered some previous loss, like the death of a loved one or other relative, that could lead to a surge of stress which could trigger a medical event. But such a case is rare in someone so young. The death of Eustace IV must remain a mystery. Lastly on our list, number one the man who died eating bugs, and the poisoned locust. Edward Archold was a 32-year-old man living in Florida. According to CNN, he was one of over 20 people that chose to participate in an event called Midnight Madness. This contest was held at Ben Siegel Reptiles, a herpetological store located in Deerfield Beach. The goal of the contest was slimy yet simple, eat as many insects and worms as possible. Whoever consumed the most would win an $850 python. It is not known how many of the creepy crawlers Archold consumed, but after the contest was over, he began to feel ill. He would go on to vomit before his friend called for medical assistance. Archold then placed a call to 911 himself before collapsing. He was taken by ambulance to a local hospital, but tragically, he would not survive the ordeal. An autopsy would confirm that Archold died from asphyxia due to choking and 
aspiration of gastric contents. His airway was reportedly obstructed by roach parts, impairing his ability to breathe. There is a character in A Dance with Dragons that almost loses their life after consuming a large quantity of insects. Strong Belwas, the blustering big belly eunuch, gorges on a giant bowl of honey-covered locusts while watching the battles play out in the fighting pits the day of their grand reopening. The locusts were offered to Queen Daenerys Targaryen by her husband, King Consort, his Darzo Lorak, but Belwas descended upon them immediately after the royal entourage entered their viewing box. Belwas bogarted the bowl. Daenerys never had a chance to try even one, which perhaps was a good thing. Immediately after finishing the bowl, Belwas began to complain of stomach pains. He requested milk to perhaps soothe his stomach only to begin retching violently. You see, the locusts were poisoned. Strong Belwas would survive this poisoning due to his sheer size and perhaps also due to his sheer amount of stubbornness. It's not for Strong Belwas to die to a bowl of bugs. Belwas would remain ill for many days, however. Hisdar said these types of honey-covered locusts are tasty, bespoking a fondness for the confection. They are rolled in spices before they are covered in honey, sort of like a hot honey sauce from our own real world. This was an obvious assassination attempt. Daenerys would be viewed as the prime target considering she is ill-loved in the city of Marine, and she has many, many enemies including the sinister Sons of the Harpy. Many want her dead, but Hisdar has an enemy or two as well, and as a Miranese noble, a Gascari, he would be more familiar with foods such as honeyed locusts. So who was the target? What would be the goal of killing off Daenerys, Hisdar, or both if peace had been achieved in Marine? And a more frightening question, who was the poisoner? Or poisoners? The perfume Seneschal Reznek Moreznek? The shave pate Skahas Mokandak, who wants Hisdar dead? Or the Green Grace? The color green is a danger sign not only for Rhaenyra Targaryen, but for her descendant Daenerys as well. Those questions and more will have to wait for another video. Thank you all for watching this video and I hope you all have enjoyed. This was supposed to be a video of me cooking three meals from the series. I actually enjoy cooking a whole lot. I've filmed myself cooking many meals of ice and fire, including honey covered locusts with a hint of cayenne pepper for kick. Unfortunately, those videos were filmed in a format not friendly to YouTube and so I can't post them here. The result? I had to cook up something different. As a hound of horror, I knew just what to do. So again, I hope you enjoyed these three deadly meals of ice and fire and how they relate to real world events. Let me know in the comments which real world example intrigued you the most. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that dinner bell for more content. Thanks to the following patrons and channel members. Consider becoming a patron or channel member yourself. Memberships start for as little as $1 a month. And the next time you read about something brutal and bloody in this series, remember, truth is stranger than fiction. I'll see you all for the next one.